Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to a very special place. Hello, Natalie. Good evening to you. It doesn't feel like evening because it's actually getting quite light, which is rather exciting. It's half past six and it's not even dark yet. Well, it's exciting for me, maybe not for anyone else. Good evening and welcome, everyone that's joining us. Hello, Tracy. Good evening to you. We're in central London. Hello, Diane. Welcome to you. And we're at a monumental place in London. As you'll find out a bit later. Hello, Anna Katrine. We've still got seven minutes to go. And as always, I've signed on nice and early just to make sure that everything is working. Make sure that my mic is turned on. My brain is turned on. That one is a little more problematic. Hello, Cheryl. And hello, Jenny. Good evening to all of you. Although it doesn't really feel like evening. It's 6.30. And it's not even dark. Anyone would think it was nearly springtime. Hello, Terry. Good evening to you. Oh, joggers, joggers, joggers everywhere. Plagued by joggers. It is a nice evening in town. Yeah. Hello, Barry. Can I repeat Monday? Couldn't log in. Barry, don't worry. If you go to my group page, so go to Nick's Castaways, you'll find all the recordings of my recent tours are there for anyone to see. Hello, Sarah. Hello, Carolyn. A ye olde cobbled street in front of us here, which is quite exciting. Got the Thames down there. We'll find that eventually. Salinas, California. That sounds nice. That sounds even better weather than here. Hello, Catherine. So we've still got about five minutes to go. Ah, good evening, Dawn. My stalwart supporter. I do like that word, stalwart. Not quite sure what it means, but it's a good word to use on any given occasion. And hello, Emma. You'll be glad to know, Emma, that we're just outside the Bob station. I'm sure that's what it's called. <laughs> oh, I see what you mean, Barry. <laughs> well done. You April fooled me without it being April the, April the 1st. Well done. No, I'm afraid, Barry, I will never be repeating that tour because it was so exclusive. And those of you that came on it will have been amazed by the sights that you saw as I led you under the secret tunnels underneath Buckingham Palace. It was quite spectacular. <laughs> Don't worry, I, I suspect Barry knows it was a joke. <laughs> That's why he's asking, can I repeat the tour I did on Monday? <laughs> it would have been a good one. I would have liked that. April for the 1st was your birthday. You're a fool. There we are. Well, I didn't want to say it myself, but seeing as you've admitted it yourself, then we, we will all agree with you. Good evening. Hi, Claire. We've got three minutes to go. And we will, of course, start on time as we always do. Exactly. Happy belated birthday, Emma. Even if you are a fool, it's still your, your birthday. So, you know, April the 1st is a good time to have a birthday.
Hello, Kay. Good evening to you. We've got about two minutes to go. And we will start on time, as we always do. And I'm at Monument Station. So named because, wait for it, there's a monument here. I know, I know. Hard to believe, but there is. And that's, of course, why the station gets its name. Funny that. You climb to the top of the monument way back in 1983 on your first trip to London, did you, Cheryl? I have yet to go up it. I, I just never, I never seem to have the time. Maybe I should make time. Maybe it would be good. Because this, for those of you that don't know what we're talking about. Hello, Chloe. This is the monument. And as you can see, it's pretty damned monumental. Hello, Kathy. There's a worse name than Bob. I'm sure there are many worse names than Bob, Emma. <laughs> many of which I've been called in my time. Have you been to the Sky Garden? I have indeed, Andrew. It's lovely. But there's now various uh, alternatives to the Sky Garden. Places that you can go for free and get amazing views of London. Good evening. Hello and welcome. It's slightly windy, but it's not raining. And it's still light, even though it's 6.30, which is weird. I'm so used to doing tours in the dark. But now... Here I am, in the daylight. I think I may melt at any point soon. I should take you to the top of the monument. There's a good idea, but I would have to come here when the monument was open. And that's difficult because it closes around five o'clock. And I don't think any of you would be around at five o'clock either. I certainly wouldn't because I'd be busy doing other stuff. Hello, Karen. And hello, Debbie. Perfect timing there. You're just in time for the start of our tour. And we are at the Monument Station. It's a bit of a windy one, as you might be able to hear. But hopefully my noise reduction technology will help with that. So that's the Monument. And it's 202 feet tall. Around 62 metres. Hello, Cindy. We're just looking at the Monumental Monument. Seeing how far back I can bend before my back begins to hurt. Ah! So this was partly designed by Sir Christopher Wren. One of the people that rebuilt most of London after the Great Fire. And as Cheryl has already said, it is possible to go up it. But only when it's open, of course. Difficult otherwise. A virtual tour is the only way. <laughs> Hello, John. Good evening to you. We're just looking at the entrance to the monument. So you can go up it. I've never actually been, which is a bit silly, really. I should at some point. Hello, Mark. Good evening to you. The monument of the Great Fire of London. For opening times, bag search, London Pass accepted here. There we are. So the monument, as I said before, let's go back a bit. Let me give you a monumental view. So the monument is 202 feet tall. Is it expensive? I don't know, Emma. I've never been there. I've never been up it. I'm sure it can't be that expensive, you know. It's only a tower. So let me give you a uh, Adam shot. Here we go. Hello, Pat. So there's the monument, and right next to it is Monument Station, strangely enough. You've done it. You need a head for heights. There we go. I'm all right with heights. It's depths that I can't stand. So there we are. Hello, David. We're just looking at the monument, and it's pretty monumental. 202 feet high, 62 meters. And it was built six years or so after the end of the fire 
that it monumentalizes, if that's a word. If it isn't, I've just invented it. So this was designed by Sir Christopher Wren to be a monument to the Great Fire of London. And it's got various inscriptions on it, as you can see. In fact, round the corner, there's a story that tells you all about how the monument was built and why it was built. So let's, uh, let's show you that. Hello, Pat. We're headed on the course of the Great Fire of London, or part of its course. So there we are, there's the inscription, and that tells you everything you need to know about the monument and the Great Fire. So there we go, have a quick read of that. What do you mean you can't, no, what? Well, you can't read Latin, what? Seriously, but I thought yeah, everyone could read Latin. Romanus Aunt Domum, for example. But don't worry, if your Latin isn't quite up to scratch, and I have to admit mine isn't either, there is a description on the other side that's in English, which is much easier to read. And here it is. The monument, designed by Robert Hooke in conjunction with Sir Christopher Wren, built 1671 on the site of St. Margaret Fish Street. So the Fire of London, it says, destroyed 13,200 houses, 87 churches, 52 livery company halls. It's a freestanding fluted Doric column, which is always good to know. And it's very close to a very famous church called St. Magnus the Martyr, which we're going to go to in a moment. And here, is an inscription, uh, a statue of sculptures of various angelic type people, one of whom is meant to be the king at the time. But there's something else that's very special about this monument. The monument, as I said before, is 202 feet high, 62 meters up to the top. There it is. Ah! Oh, there's a good view. So 202 feet is the height of this column. And it was built that way on purpose. So the idea is that if you knocked this column over, if you came and chipped away at its foundations, and eventually the whole structure crashed to the floor, and it crashed towards me. Hello, Shannon. We're just talking about the monument falling down which I'm not actually hoping for at the moment, because I would be in its path. But if it did fall down, if it was pushed over, it would land 202 feet away, or the top of it would. And 202 feet away is meant to mark the spot where the Great Fire of London started on Sunday the 2nd of September, 1666. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. You went up as a child and had to be carried up and <laughs> carried all the way back down. Exactly, Emma, I think I'll need that too as an adult. Now there's another memorial here to the Great Fire. And you can see the inscriptions on the benches. And it's a popular children's song. London's burning, London's burning. Fetch the engines, fetch the engines. Fire, 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 fire. Pour on water, pour on water. So that's an old nursery rhyme, a very old tale of the Great Fire of London. But the Great Fire itself started where the monument would end up if it was pushed over, fell over on top of me. I, of course, would be squashed, but it would be all in a good cause because it would mark the spot where the Great Fire started. And that spot, was here, Pudding Lane. Now Pudding Lane obviously looked very different back in the day to the way it looks now. It's now full of office blocks, Victorian buildings. You're sitting there singing that. Hello Diane, it's a good song to sing. 
but it would have looked very different back in the day. This was a street full of baking bakeries and uh, all sorts of food shops were located along this street. And of course, it looks so different because none of that remains. It was all destroyed in the Great Fire. And the Great Fire started here on Pudding Lane on Sunday the 2nd of September at about one o'clock in the morning. Hello, Matthew. We're just looking at Pudding Lane, which is where the Great Fire of London started. And it started in a bakery. And by a rather ironic coincidence, the bakery was the home of the master baker to the royal family, Charles I at the time. So, sorry, Charles II. So this was Thomas Farinor. He was the master baker for Charles II. And it was in his bakery that the conflagration first began. Now, Thomas Farinor was here with his family. It was a family-run business. At about 1 a.m. on Sunday, the 2nd of September, there was a fire that started down near the ovens, possibly because the ovens had been left on, not been shut down properly. But for whatever reason, the fire quickly spread. And the main reason the fire spread was because the house and most of the houses next to it were made of wood, often with thatched roofs. So it was very easy for this fire to start and to spread rapidly. And it would have looked something like this. It's a recreation of these timbered thatched roof buildings that went up in smoke during the Great Fire. But the first one to go was Thomas Farinor's house, the master baker. Now he managed to rescue his family. So he allowed his, he, he got his family to escape to safety. And they did that by jumping out of the top floor window because the fire had started on the ground floor where the ovens were. So they climbed out of the top floor window and they climbed across onto a neighboring house. And that's the way they got out, except there was one person that didn't climb out, and that was the maid. The maid of the household, the servant who might well have been personally responsible for starting the great fire, was too afraid to climb out of that top floor window and scoot across to the house next door. And so she was left. Unfortunately, there was no way of rescuing her. And she became the first fatality of the great fire of London. Now, normally you would expect me to say many more fatalities soon followed, but that's not quite the case. The official records for the number of deaths during the Great Fire of London is six. That was it. Six deaths. That's the official records. Actually, it was probably far more for reasons that I'll explain as we go on. Good evening, everyone. Everyone that's joining us, welcome to you. We're just talking about the start of the Great Fire here on Pudding Lane at the house of Thomas Farinor, the master baker. But the fire quickly spread and it spread because of the thatched roofs and the wooden timbers of most of the houses in this area. Now I'm going to cause, or we're going to chart the course of that fire or part of it. It spread in all directions, but mostly to start with, it was blown by the wind and the course of the fire started off heading towards the River Thames. And so that's where we're going to head as well. So for those of you that joined a little late, there it is again, the monument, looking very monumental, designed by Robert Hook and Sir Christopher Wren. Hello, Janice. And we're going to follow in the footsteps of the fire and also in the footsteps of one famous person who chronicled the Great Fire. More about him in a moment. No scaffolding, don't worry, Michael. We will, we will find scaffolding. Now, I should have mentioned at the start of the tour, by the way, all day long I've been talking about fires. And that's because I'm doing tours of Speaker's House at the moment in Parliament. And when I do these tours, people often ask me, did Parliament burn down in the Great Fire of London? 
And I have to tell them, no, it didn't. Parliament burnt down in a very different fire in 1834. The fire that destroyed most of London happened in 1666. So there we are. There's my parliamentary reference. And as we go around, I'm sure we will find plenty of scaffolding. This is central London, after all. You can't escape it. Now, many of the names of these streets give you an indication of what went on in this area. This is Monument Street, obviously, but we have some rather fishy names here that indicate what type of goods and services were sold here. Like this one. Get a closer look. Fish Street Hill, you see? All telling you the kind of shops and services that would be available in this area. Hello, Alfie, and your big thumb. Good evening to you. We're taking a walk down Fish Street Hill, following in the path of the Great Fire, and heading towards the Church of St. Magnus the Martyr. And this is one of many churches that was rebuilt by Sir Christopher Wren after the Great Fire. So on Sunday morning, Sunday the 2nd of September 1666, the fire had started in the bakery and it quickly spread to the neighbouring houses. It was also blown by the wind and the wind began blowing it down towards the River Thames, obliterating churches and buildings in its path. But luckily, there was one man who was there at the time he lived very nearby, and he was the man who might be able to sort out all of this mess. He was a famous man. He was also secretary to the Navy at the time, a personal friend of King Charles II. Surely a man like that, a man of action, a man of honour, would know what to do in the event of the Great Fire. The gentleman I'm talking about was Samuel Pepys. Samuel Pepys was a close friend of Charles II. He'd written the account of Charles II's great escape, his return to England, and he was very well known at the time. He was also in charge of the finances from the Navy. Here he is. There's Samuel Pepys. Michael Lynch, it's true, it was a hot summer. I know, I know we can't remember that far back in Britain when it was actually a hot summer, but it was, it was one of the hottest summers on record, and that really didn't help matters. If it had been nowadays, of course, the fire wouldn't have got very far, because it would have rained by the afternoon. But at the time, it was a long, dry and hot summer. So this is Samuel Pepys. Now he wrote over a million words in his diaries. Oh, <laughs> got a fire engine going past. <laughs> How prophetic. So Samuel Pepys wrote over a million words in his diaries. It survived the Great Plague. It stayed in London all through the Great Plague of the previous year. And now he would go on to chronicle his experiences of the Great Fire. Now, being a man of action, of course, you would have expected him to be right on the scene, at the heart of the moment, helping to work out what to do about this growing inferno. But we know from his diaries that wasn't, that wasn't quite the case. This is what he wrote in his personal diary at the time. Some of our maids sitting up late last night to get things ready against our feast today. Jane called us up about three in the morning to tell us of a great fire they saw in the city. So I rose slipped on my nightgown and went to her window and thought it to be on the back side of Mark Street. But being unused to such fires as followed, I thought it far enough off. And so I went to back to bed again and to sleep. Oh, dawn, spoiler alert. So that's what Samuel Pepys did, this so-called man of action. When he was told about the great fire, 
he decided just to go back to bed. Not exactly the, the actions that we would have expected of such a heroic character. Now we're going to cross the road, which of course is one of the most dangerous occupations in London. And also one of the most time consuming. Let's see how long it takes before we get a green light to cross. Let's give it a go. Here we go. The button is pressed. And now we must wait for hours, maybe days, hoping against hope. Oh, there's the shard poking over the top of St. Magnus Church. Do you see? You see? Oh, there we go. There we go. We made it. It's all good. Uh oh, time limit. Quick, quick. So this is the church of St. Magnus the Martyr, and it's one of many churches that was rebuilt by Sir Christopher Wren. Let's give you a little. I know, I should, I should trust more, shouldn't I? Hello, Kelly. We're just looking at the frontage of St. Magnus the Martyr Church. And it's one of many churches that was rebuilt by Sir Christopher Wren after the Great Fire. So when the fire started, Samuel Pepys, the great diarist, the MP, the friend of Charles II, decided to go back to bed. Not exactly the man of action we would have expected, but luckily there was someone else. And he was the Lord Mayor of London, and his name was Sir Thomas Bloodworth. You would think certainly with a name like that, Sir Thomas Bloodworth, Lord Mayor of London, that he would be in the position to take decisive action when that occurred. Oh, now I need to show you a picture. Huh? Here we go. There he is. There's Sir Thomas Bloodworth, the Lord Mayor of London at the time. And he was informed on Monday morning, very early in the morning, about the fire. And Sir Thomas Bloodworth went a little closer to look at it. Not too close, of course, because, you know, he didn't want to get too involved scaffolding. <sighs> Behind me, there we are. My day is complete. We've had the parliamentary reference and now we've got scaffolding too. There we are. I knew I could do it. Sir Thomas Bloodworth got close to the fire, not close enough to be in any real danger, and then gave his professional opinion. He said to the people that had roused him from his slumber, ah, you call that a fire? A woman could piss it out. That was his professional opinion. And then he too went back to bed. Not exactly the stuff of action films, not really kind of Bruce Willis territory. More like, uh, like someone else. Not so actually. Yay, scaffolding. So we didn't have a very good record. Samuel Pepys had gone back to bed. Thomas Bloodworth had said that a woman could piss it out. So it didn't look like anyone was seriously coming to help. The people, of course, did go and try and help. But they weren't equipped. They weren't trained. And so they couldn't stop the fire from spreading rapidly. And about six o'clock on Monday morning, the servant who first spotted it wakes up Samuel Pepys again. And this is what she said. This is what he says. By and by, Jane comes and tells me that she hears above 300 houses have been burned down tonight by the fire we saw and that it is now burning down all Fish Street Lane by London Bridge. So I made myself ready presently and walked to the tower and there got up upon one of the high places, Sir Jay's son with me. And there I did see the houses at that end of the bridge all on fire and an infinite great fire on this and the other side, which among other people did trouble me. So there we are, finally. He's troubled. They've got through to him. His servants have made him realise that this fire 
is far more than a little ordinary fire and it's spreading at an alarming rate. And it was spread mostly by the wind. A strong wind was pushing it towards the River Thames. And that's where we're headed now. We're actually going to follow a bit of the Thames path. And the Thames path runs, as the name suggests, all along the side of the Thames. Oh, a blue plaque. What's this? This churchyard formed part of the roadway approach to old London Bridge, 1176 to 1831. Now, as you can see from this plaque, London Bridge survived the Great Fire, but it was a close thing. We're going to follow the course of the fire and also the course of the Thames Path, which runs along the river. And it's a beautiful way to see the river goes through the centre of London and out into the countryside. And I don't have to cross any roads to get there, which is even better. So this is the Thames Path, or part of it, and this is the way we're going. OK, I know it doesn't look very beautiful at the moment, but don't worry. It will get more beautiful as we get closer to the Thames. 42! <laughs> We've got 42 people in our little group. I like that. I always knew I'd find the answer to life, the universe and everything. And there it is. Uh-oh. We're entering the windy zone. I'm hoping that my noise-cancelling microphone will do its job. <laughs> Quite well here, but we'll soon find out. Here we go. Oh, there we go, two people have left. I lost the answer to life, the universe and everything. What a shame. See the sun coming down, finally. Blimey, I'm in a wind tunnel. Don't worry, it will, it will change. I feel confident. There we are. Ah, there we go. That bit was just a little windy bit. So here we are approaching the Thames and, of course, as well as scaffolding and parliamentary references, one thing I almost always include is the Shard. And there it is, in all its glory. I usually look at it at night, or I have been for the last few months. It's quite nice to see it during the day. Exactly, an umbrella just wouldn't have worked. It would have been pretty redundant. There's the HMS Belfast, Tower Bridge in the background, or the usual Thames paraphernalia. So the Great Fire of London had been pushed towards the river, and eventually it reached what was at the time the only bridge in London. And that, of course, is London Bridge. Now, London Bridge has changed many times. This is the latest incarnation built in the 1960s. The one before that was sold to the Americans, and it ended up in Arizona, in a place called Lake Havasu. It's true, every word of it. And they go water skiing there. What is the shore for? The shore? I'm not sure I understand, Connie. I think you may have misspelled something there. Unless you mean these big things, waiting down boats. Oh, the shard. <laughs> what is the shard for? It's used for various offices. There's restaurants at the top. Olivia was kind enough to take me there for my birthday a few months ago, or earlier this month, in fact. I can't remember when my own birthday is. So yeah, there's restaurants up there as well. And you get some fantastic views from up the top of the shire. So this bridge has been rebuilt many times. And you probably know that at one time, back in medieval London, it had shops and houses all along its length. And that, of course, oh, joggers, hundreds of them. That, of course, made it a real fire hazard. 
But luckily, it wasn't a fire hazard that would mean that the whole bridge would get burned up. Here's a picture of what it looked like at the time. You could see the bridge going across and the houses on it. And that's the north side of the river, this side. But the fire never reached the south side. I know, I'd love to have seen that bridge as well. The fire never got across the bridge because luckily there'd been a previous fire about 50 years before. And that had left a fire break, a kind of natural fire break right in the middle. And that meant that when the fire was raging across the bridge, it didn't manage to get all the way across. If it had, it would have been a real problem and the fire would have spread into South London as well as North. But it didn't get that far. But Samuel Pepys had to see for himself. He wanted to take a look at what the damage was that this fire was causing to the bridge. And so he hired a boat and he went out onto the Thames to get a better look, to see what was happening to the bridge itself. Many people at the time hired boats and the boatmen charged huge prices, thousands of pounds in today's money, to take people and their possessions across to the safe south side of the river. But Samuel Pepys did manage to see exactly what was going on. And again, this is what he wrote in his diary. Everybody endeavouring to remove their goods and flinging them into the river or bringing them into lighters that lay off. Poor people staying in their houses as long as till the very fire touched them and then running into boats or clambering from one pair of stairs by the waterside to another. And among other things, the poor pigeons, I perceive, were loath to leave their houses, but hovered about the windows and balconies until they were, some of them, burned their wings and fell down dead. Exactly, Sarah. Money before safety. Many of the people, many of the boatmen, made huge amounts of money out of other people's misery. I know it was amazing that it didn't burn down, but it did survive all the way up until the 1830s. So the fire had been stopped in the middle of London Bridge, but there was worse to come because the wind changed direction. And the wind was now blowing the fire into the old city of London and towards, towards the financial heart of the district. And again, we're going to follow the route that the fire took. Meanwhile, Samuel Pepys had been summoned by the king to give an account of what the fire was like. The king, as I said before, was Charles II. Now, Charles II had a bit of an image problem. He wasn't quite as well respected as Charles III. He wasn't quite as foolish as Charles I. He was somewhere in between. And he was at the time also fighting a losing battle against the Dutch, a shipping battle to see who could be ruling the seas. And he was losing that battle. He wasn't a popular king in many ways to start with. He was often known as uh, a king that was too fond of having extramarital affairs and partying. So he was known pretty much as the, the party animal a foolish king who didn't really have an effective reign. But he was the one that summoned Samuel Pepys to, the, the, to, his, to his side to find out what was going on with the Great Fire. And Samuel Pepys promptly replied. And he told the king what was going on. So I was called for and did tell the king and Duke of York what I saw and that unless his majesty 
did command houses to be pulled down. Nothing could stop the fire. They seemed much troubled, and the king commanded me to go to my Lord Mayor, Sir Thomas Bloodworth, and command him to spare no houses, but to pull down before the fire every way. The Duke of York bid me tell him that if he would have any more soldiers, he shall. So this was the king's response. He was actually quite proactive. He gave Samuel Pepys the authority to send soldiers into the city. And this was a dangerous thing for the King Charles to do because London, the city of London, was pretty much independent from the monarchy at the time. And they certainly didn't like many of the previous kings and queens. They weren't particularly fond of Charles. So sending royal soldiers into the city was seen as a potentially dangerous move. But Charles II realized that this was one of the only ways that they would be able to stop the course of the fire. What he wanted them to do was use grappling hooks, specially designed, to pull down many of the houses, especially the ones that were made of timber. And that, it was thought, would provide some sort of fire breaks and stop the course of the fire. Here we are again, <sighs> waiting once again for the green man. I'm sure it'll turn up eventually. <sighs> or maybe not. Maybe I'll have to do the whole of the tour from here. A static tour, it will be. Oh no, there we go. Eventually. So that's what happened. The king told Samuel Pepys to go back to find the Lord Mayor, Sir Thomas Bloodworth, and to tell him to tear down many of the private houses around the fire. The trouble was that Sir Thomas Bloodworth was, as we've discovered, not exactly a man of action. He was the one that had said that a woman could piss out the fire and promptly gone back to bed. It eventually got up and went with some of the townspeople to try and put out the fire. So when Samuel Pepys reached him near the scene of the growing inferno, this is what he said. To the king's message, he recried like a fainting woman, Lord, what am I to do? I am spent. People will not obey me. I have been pulling down houses, but the fire overtakes us faster than we can do it. He then said that he needed no more soldiers and that for himself, he must go and refresh himself, having been at work all night. So there was no help there. In fact, Sir Thomas Bloodworth had another reason not to order soldiers to pull down the houses. He was Lord Mayor, and it would make a bad impression politically, or at least that's what he thought. And because of that, the fire continued at a huge pace. Now, there were fire engines at the time, so there was some sort of fire protection system, but the fire engines were, how shall I put this, a little primitive. This is what they looked like. This is an early fire engine. Now this is actually a deluxe model because it's got wheels and most fire engines didn't. They were pulled on sleds, which obviously didn't make them terribly fast and effective. And they were also fed from central reservoirs, reservoirs of water to be used in emergencies. And those pumps, those reservoirs of water, had been stored underneath London Bridge and they burnt. And so there was no more water in the pumps. In fact, there were no more pumps. So that was another problem that caused the fire to spread out of control. Now again, for those of you that joined us even later, we're walking back past the monument. There it is again. 
looking even more monumental than it did 20 minutes ago. So the fire began to spread out of control and it was pushing its way towards the city. This was by Monday afternoon. The fire had been raging now for some 12, 13 hours and no one could stop it. At the same time the fire was raging, people began to come up with conspiracy theories. They wanted to know how the fire had started. And many of them had their own ideas. A lot of them thought it was the French or the Catholics or the Dutch, or in fact, all three. So you know what it's like whenever some terrible event occurs, somebody needs to take the blame. And luckily there were people, lots of people, that were suitable targets to be these shadowy conspirators. The French, of course, because, well, because they were French. That was probably enough reason. And the Dutch, because we were at war with the Dutch at the time. So these were all legitimate targets that were very possibly the ones that had started the fire in the first place. Oh, look, a green man. And because of that, people started to die. And they didn't die because of the fire. They died because there were gangs of vigilantes that began roaming the streets, looking for people to blame, looking for someone to put the blame on, someone that they could then take out their aggression on, their desperation. And so during the early days of the fire, the early hours, many foreign nationals were killed, hung up, beaten to death by squads of vigilantes looking for someone to blame. So that in itself raised the death toll. As I mentioned earlier, the official death toll for the Great Fire of London was six. But that's just ridiculous. And six is just not a realistic number given the extent of the fire. Exactly, Janice. It couldn't just be a simple accident. There had to be a conspiracy behind it. There had to be someone to blame, someone to put the blame on. And luckily there were lots of people at the time that fitted that category. God, I made it across the road without being killed by a cyclist. Exactly, Dawn, six important people. And the reason that the uh, statistics were probably very different is because many of the people that died in the fire were not important. In fact, some of them were hidden and they were hidden in the rookeries, the underground houses, the old tenement blocks that had been taken over by people who couldn't afford anything else and also by criminals. And these people chose to stay in London they had nowhere else to go. And so they almost certainly became victims of the Great Fire. So we're going to head up this little lane here, our church lane. And it all gets in light, nice and quiet here, apart from the pub. It's one of the many pubs tucked away in these little hidden corners of London. Everybody drinking outside. The great London tradition. Whether it's winter or summer, you'll always see people outside the pub in London. Mainly because most of those pubs are far too small for people to drink inside. So King Charles had to issue a proclamation and he sent out a kind of newsletter a proclamation, a written proclamation, saying that the fire had started by accident and that actually no one was really to blame and that these vigilante squads should stop what they were doing at once.
But that didn't stop the fire. The fire continued to spread, pushed by the wind that was driving it towards the financial heart of the city. And it would eventually reach the city's financial uh, centre, a place called the Royal Exchange. And that's where we're going now. One of my favourite buildings in London. Right, I'm going to try again. See if I can get across. Oh yes, we've done it. <clears throat> oh, and to get there, we're going to uh, head down yet another little lane. Now, <sighs> I would take you down Nicholas's passage, but I'm not sure I know you that well. Uh, yeah, we, we won't go there. It's a good name for a road, but uh, maybe not Nicholas's passage. That's a little too close for comfort for me. And we're going to come round the back of the Royal Exchange. And the Royal Exchange for hundreds of years had been the financial heart of the city, the place where the bankers gathered. In the 19th century, the rebuilt Royal Exchange would be used as the setting for one of the scenes in A Christmas Carol. The scene where some of Scrooge's so-called friends talk about his death. Here we go, I'm going to take you down another little package. Package, or even passage. Because I love going down these little alleyways, passages that lead off. Oh, blue, that's nice. Because that's the interesting bit of London. As well as the great grand houses, I think the interesting bit are the little alleyways. Especially if they're named after Nicholas. This one is Change Alley. Change, in this case, is a shortened version of the Royal Exchange, which is the grand building we're coming to. But this is the rebuilt version. In fact, it's been rebuilt twice because the Royal Exchange has burned down twice. Once in 1666, in the Great Fire, and once in the 1800s, another unrelated fire. So this is the new, improved Royal Exchange. And it is quite beautiful inside. And I'm going to show you how beautiful it is. As long as it's still open, of course. Let's find out. Oh, that gate's closed. Okay. I can't take you that way, but I will take you around the corner. Hello, Lynn. We're just trying to figure a way to get you in to the Royal Exchange. So this is the modern version of a much older building. And it used to be the financial heart of the city, the place where all the bankers gathered. But there is a way in. I'm sure, because there's restaurants in there. And I'm sure the restaurants wouldn't have closed. So we're going to go around the back. And that is where I think we'll get in. Let's see. Let's find out if we can get an entrance in this way. Aha! There we are. That's more like it. Here we are. The Royal Exchange. Now this used to be where bankers offices and shops were based, but nowadays it's more of a pie into commerce and it's been filled with very expensive retail outlets and restaurants, as we'll see when we get inside. Oh, 
Thank you. Here we go. This is the Royal Exchange. Isn't it lovely? Oh, and the smell is even lovely. It's making me hungry just thinking about it. There's a champagne bar in the middle, very similar to the one that you could find at St. Pancras Station called Circe's. And these used to be the offices of the financial profession. But as you can see, the lower level has now been taken over by various expensive shops, Tiffany & Co. As you can see over here, it is wow. It's a lovely place. I'm determined to go and have a meal here with Olivia at some point. And here's Fort and Mason Champagne Bar. So you can see the level that's going on here. The level of poshness. Doodles. So there we are. A taste of the good life. The newly rebuilt Royal Exchange. And just as impressive is what this building looks like from the outside. Huge Doric columns towering above us. How much is champagne? Well, at St Pancras Dawn, we paid around £15 a glass, which is, yeah, quite a lot. So it's not cheap. But then you're not expecting it to be cheap. It's bound to be expensive. There's the Duke of Wellington, the hero of Waterloo, the gentleman on the horse. And there's Bank Station, that's where we are. We're next to Mansion House, which is the residence or the offices of the uh, Mayor of London. The Lord Mayor, not the Mayor. There's two Mayors, one of them is a Lord Mayor and the other is just a Mayor. I know, it's a bit of a nightmare. <clears throat> I just thought of that pun, you could tell, couldn't you? So this is the Grand front entrance designed to look some like some sort of Roman temple which it does very admirably and you can see there's an inscription up at the top and it says uh, well it's Latin again and if I get a bit closer so I can actually see then I can tell you what that inscription says so let's have a look Anno Elizabeth Conduim Anno Victoria Restaurantum yeah so it says that the uh, the the central heating the the air conditioning was installed in the reign of Elizabeth the first uh, Elizabeth Regina no, yeah, Elizabeth I. She installed the air conditioning and Queen Victoria installed the restaurants. Um, I think that's what it says. I'm sure somebody told me once that's what it says. What it actually says is it comes from the reign of Queen Elizabeth and it was rebuilt in the reign of Queen Victoria. That sounds a bit more believable, doesn't it? So this is the grand facade of the Royal Exchange. And the Royal Exchange would eventually be burnt by the Great Fire. The Great Fire had raged all the way through the city of London and it had reached the heart of the financial empire of London. Now along the way I'm going to post links as I always do. 
where you can tip me and show your lovely appreciation on PayPal and buy me a coffee. And I've just posted one, I'm sure it'll pop up in a moment. Yep, there's the Duke of Wellington. So by the time the fire had reached the Royal Exchange, many people had tried to hide their possessions. And many people had brought them here. They thought, well, this is a big, strong bank. And surely this will be a good place to keep our belongings because the fire would never manage to penetrate its walls. Now, of course, the walls I'm talking about were not these walls. They looked a bit different. And in a moment, I'm going to show you what they looked like. So this was the old Royal Exchange. So it was kind of open air design, as you can see here. And it was really rather impressive. Oh, thank you very much, Kay and Alfie. And that's very kind of you. So there it is. There's the old Royal Exchange. But the fire, the Great Fire, would eventually reach the Royal Exchange itself. And one person saw it happen. And he was one of the financial workers that used this as his offices. The Royal Exchange, the glory of the merchants, is now invaded with much violence. And when once the fire was entered, how quickly did it run round the galleries, filling them with flames, then descendeth the stairs, encompasseth the walk, giving forth flaming volleys, and filleth them with sheets of fire. By and by, down and fall all the kings upon their faces, and the greatest part of the stone building with them, with such a noise as was dreadful and horrific. Well, thank you very much, David. That's very kind. I need a coffee. It's been a long day. So, against all prediction, the Great Fire had reached and engulfed the Royal Exchange. And now it continued on a different path. Having destroyed the financial institution of London, it was now headed for the religious heart of the city. It was going to engulf St. Paul's Cathedral itself. Except at the time, it wasn't a cathedral. It was only a church, but it was a very important one. To do that, of course, we will need to negotiate more roads, but the streets are getting quieter. Rush hour is nearly over. That's Mansion House. That's the home of the Lord Mayor of London. Or the, the offices of the Lord Mayor. But we're heading this way. And we're heading down a street with an interesting name. Now, of course, there are many interesting named streets in London. But this one I particularly like. Now, most of these names give an indication of the kind of work that went on here and the, the nature of the area back in Victorian times and the Elizabethan times. And that's certainly true here because this used to be where lots of markets were based, meat markets. And so the name of the street is Poultry. That's it. Not Poultry Lane, not Poultry Road but just poultry. That gives you a real idea of what went on here. Another blue plaque, site of St. Mildred's Church, demolished 1872, and another one that was rebuilt by Sir Christopher Wren. But we're heading again down the path of the fire, and as the fire raged through the city, an unlikely hero would come to the aid of the citizens. And the hero was the king, King Charles II, possibly in a plea to kind of vamp up his image and make himself look more heroic than he really was. He decided to join in the firefighting uh, 
activities. And here you can see a romanticized Victorian version of King Charles II bravely joining the fray, helping to get the buckets of water from the river and carry them over to where the fires were burning. Whether he did that out of a true sense of altruism or simply because he wanted to look good and prove to be a heroic king, we don't know. But it certainly worked. People's attitudes to King Charles changed radically after the Great Fire of London. Samuel Pepys, by this time, was also thinking about saving his own possessions. And one possession in particular he wanted to save that was very dear to him. And he wanted to make sure that it was well looked after. Sir W. Batten, not knowing how to remove his wine, did dig a pit in the garden and laid it there. And I took the opportunity of laying all the papers of my office that I could not otherwise dispose of. And in the evening, Sir W. Penn and I did dig another and put our wine in it and I my Parmesan cheese. There we are. That was what was important to Samuel Pepys. He buried his cheese. Now that isn't quite as silly as it sounds because cheese, Parmesan cheese at the time, was almost literally worth its weight in gold. So it was a very expensive product. And that's why he chose to bury it. A huge round L of cheese. I think he came back to it later and dug it up after the fire. Possibly it was turned to fondue by that time. Who knows? But many other people took their possessions to the place they thought would be completely safe because it was protected by God. They took them to St. Paul's Church. St. Paul's Church had stood there since medieval times and even before that there had been a place of worship there. Back in Roman times there was a temple there. So this seemed to be a good place to take all their belongings somewhere that would uh, survive the conflagration. The first tour I've watched since Hago, and this is even better. Oh, David, thank you very much. I'm glad you enjoy it. Now, I have to say that lovely as Hago was, there were times when I wasn't terribly impressed with the picture quality. But what I found on Facebook Live is that usually the picture quality is brilliant. And I'm sure there's all sorts of reasons for that, but it does make a difference having a, a nice, clear picture. But thank you anyway. So here's another one of those many churches rebuilt by Sir Christopher Wren. And this one has a special story behind it as well. We'll get a bit closer. Good, I'm glad you think so, David. For me, Facebook Live is quite a good medium to use. I know other people use things like uh, uh, YouTube to record their tours, but I quite like the idea of Facebook Live. Across the road again. place below. <laughs> There's a cafe underneath it. Of course there is. So this is Cheapside. And the church is St. Mary Le Beau. And this is mentioned in a very famous nursery rhyme. This is one of the bells that features in the story, or the rhyme, oranges and lemons say the bells of St. Clement's. So this is one of the many churches in London that's mentioned in that rhyme. In fact, they think the nursery rhyme was meant to be an early kind of Google Maps guide to London, because you would know roughly where you were 
by the sound of the bells that you could hear, the bells relating to each church in a different area, often in East London. Now we're heading towards St Paul's and in order to give you a really spectacular view, I'm going to have to take you into a shopping centre. I do apologise, but that's the way we have to go. The shopping centre itself is called One Change. And again, it's a reference to the Royal Exchange, the shortened version of its name. So that's where we're going, inside the shopping centre. But there is a reason, because in this shopping centre lies a hidden secret. One of the greatest views of St Paul's Cathedral that I've been able to find. And I'm going to share it with you. One thing, of course, I loved about Hago was the postcard facility. And many people would, of course, take thousands of postcards during the tour. Yes, I'm looking at you, Dawn. So sadly, there isn't really much of a modern Facebook alternative to that. But you might be able to grab a screenshot, especially if you're looking at this on your phone, then you can just grab a screenshot anyway. But it is one of the best views of St Paul's. Yes, you know it, Dawn. Thousands of postcards. Here we go. Look at that. It's so good, of course, because you've got the reflections in the glass offices on either side. Of course, that's why they built it that way. They wanted to create this beautiful vista of St. Paul's. So by this time, the fire had been raging for three days. And on the Tuesday evening, St. Paul's itself would be burned to the ground. So this was the last great conflagration of the Great Fire. But the church that stood there looked very different. It was much more old-fashioned church. Oh, I found this picture, by the way. This happened seven years ago when they projected a kind of laser fire effect onto the top of St. Paul's. Hello, Pam. Good evening to you. I'm afraid we're just nearly at the point where we're finishing our tour. We've come to the Dome of St. Paul's Cathedral as it is. It was rebuilt by Sir Christopher Wren, but there was a much older church that stood on this site. And that's what burnt down on the Tuesday evening, the 5th of September, 1666, St. Paul's was burnt to the ground, including all the books that were stored within it, the religious library that was there, the roof practically melted of the church and rain led down into the cellars. The cellars were where people had tried to store their belongings and their belongings were burnt as well. But by the next morning, by Wednesday, the, the uh, 6th of September, the fire had started to abate, started to die down. And by Thursday, it had almost completely stopped. The reason it had stopped is the wind had died down and they were able to effectively fight the fire. But by that time, it had destroyed over 15,000 houses, but only apparently killed six people, which as we've discovered is almost certainly not true. Bad statistics. But what it meant is that London needed to be rebuilt. And there were all sorts of plans made about how to rebuild the city. Many people wanted it designed in a different way entirely, made in a French style, with long straight roads, orderly and efficient, so that any fire could be quickly identified and dealt with. 
But luckily, the town planners disagreed. And the Lord Mayor of London decided that they wouldn't change much. They rebuilt the churches, they rebuilt many of the buildings in the area, but they didn't alter the basic design. And I'm glad they didn't, because that's the bit that I like about London. I like the hidden alleyways, the little streets and courts that lead off from the city, because they give you a real idea of what London is like, and it's there that you can find London's secrets. And on that note, a rather cheery note, considering the topic of our talk, that's the end of my tour. Thank you all very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed the tour. If you did, please do show your appreciation. And I'm just going to post that link once more, where you can find links to buy me a coffee and PayPal. There we go. But in the meantime, thank you all very much for coming. I hope you've enjoyed the tour. And a special request to those of you that are watching. Do tune in to my new podcast, londonkills.co.uk. You can find it on Podbean. And there you will find many more tales of terror. It's all about death in the capital. Not just murders, but all kinds of death and destruction in the capital city. And you can find that on my website, on my Facebook page. You'll find a link to londonkills.co.uk. And there you can find two brilliant episodes of my new podcast. So thank you all very much for coming. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the evening. And as the sun finally goes down behind me, I wish you a very good night. And I look forward to seeing you next week around the same time. Thank you and good night.